कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती हैं बातें किताबें करती हैं बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं बातें वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक टू हिम अबाउट हिज लेटेस्ट बुक एंटिसिपेटिंग इंडिया वी आर डिलाइटेड टू हैव इन द स्टूडियो टूडे शेखर गुप्ता the editor in chief of indian express welcome shekhar to the program thank you very much jasli i'm i'm glad to know that we still discuss books on television these days we especially do it on doordarshan and I think uh, we only have on great doordarshan so my compliments to you and thank you very much thank you thank you very much to the team um shekhar let's talk about your latest book this is now in a time where people hardly read books or or actually they are reading more books and, but people do believe that because of television books and uh, print journalism is kind of taking a back seat what made you bring come up with this book well i think uh, first of all uh, i feel like a cockroach in the sense that you know uh, you know you, you can you can look sort of very insignificant as in print media yeah. but at the same time uh, you have the ability to out outlive everything and everything else i think there is a certain uh durability uh and a certain thick skinnedness to old fashioned print journalism and frankly i it suits me to believe that the interest in reading is back i think uh now there's a backlash against the trivialization of news trivialization of opinion uh, reducing everything to 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 me me uh you know 9 or 10 or 12 squares fighting with each other the volume goes up without you having to touch the remote control Yes, so, the news has become more sensational than pithy, really. Well, uh, it's become non-newsy. In, yeah. fa- in fact, one, one, the gap between news and views has disappeared. Mm-hmm. And second, as, as I keep saying, sort of in an un- in an old-fashioned way, that opinion, uh, well-argued opinion in the media, in public discourse, in a seminar, in a discussion. it's being replaced by the short term pov point of view mm-hmm. and anybody can have a point of view of anything you know i can have a point of view about this studio i can have a point of view about what i am wearing mm-hmm. uh, but that's a point of view and opinion is something that based on facts arguments which lead to a conclusion then somebody can agree with it or disagree with it or somebody can argue with you and come up with a variant of it or a hybrid of it mm. that is opinion so i think i think right now uh, i think the conflict between pov and opinion for a, for some time was i think unfairly won by pov so in 140 characters you could give you a pov mm-hmm. i think this government is useless i think this batsman uh, should be playing left handed or whatever it's now uh, 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 i i think now at least i'm hoping there is a return of well argued opinion and that's why this book i think is well timed it is definitely well timed uh it must have been difficult to uh get the book together because you've uh, selected 100 odd uh, articles from your national interest which is an iconic column in the indian express well uh you know out of uh, 900 uh, 100 odd well it's uh, uh, it's it's tempted tempting to say that it's ten- yes. ten- tempting to use the usual line which is yeah. that you know for, for columnist every column is like a child so how do you make a selection but frankly right. it's not such a difficult selection to make because when you reread what you've been writing uh, on a weekly basis because every week there's a deadline and you have to write mm-hmm. you you re- realize that you also write a lot of stuff which you don't want to read again <laughs> right so 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 there is a lot of self selection a lot of things just get uh, either look outdated or they look like god i wrote this how could i have written this <laughs> right uh, so so it it isn't that difficult and also since the purpose was anticipating india once we got the theme then we look at we looked at things which had anticipated change or which had reflected the change as it began to happen as anticipated maybe a few months or a few years earlier so 
and in any case we only chose the political columns i write about everything uh, including cricket and hockey and uh, and films and films i mean the and, odd one uh, yes. those become the themes of your uh, or at least the titles of uh, many of your articles on uh, on politics but well, yes i think uh, meena you know, kumari and the meena kumari syndrome there was babu ji dheere chalna yeah. about india's bureaucracy mo moving very slowly but more than that you know uh, there are a few about films themselves but these are drawing from films to uh, to make a larger social point Uh, for example there is one that draws from dil chahta hai the film yes and yes. it struck me that it was the first bollywood film uh, in which which was a completely unabashed unembarrassed celebration of being rich absolutely so all the three boys were rich all their girlfriends were rich they drank champagne they drove expensive cars mm. completely unapologetically in a traditional hindi film one of the three would have been poor Ideally, one of the three would have been the son of the widowed maid servant, working in the house of one of the other two, right? And then the other two would have gone to his home and told his mother, auntie, "जो आपके हाथ के खाने का मज़ा है वो कहीं भी नहीं है." So that film defied everything, and I think we we then anticipated some change that India was now really moving into this aspirational stage, uh, where to be rich, to create wealth. uh was not a crime in in fact it was an aspiration and where people who create wealth will now become new icons and they'll be respected in fact this is an interesting metaphor for indian politics also where on the one hand um you know there is the traditional politics but but the time when you started writing the column uh, which is about 19 odd years ago indian politics was also changing so the melodrama of the great indian family of the indian politics was also changing and there were new formulae which were coming in do you think you were uh, you started the column at, at the right time in a sense well i think i started uh, i started writing about indian politics at the right time because right. i say i think in the introduction of the book also uh, in the many years that i had been journalist before that uh, almost uh, 6 and 12 about 19 years Uh, i had not exactly covered indian politics i had done some political stories mm -hmm. i had interacted with, with some politicians but i did not really cover party politics i was covering various crises in punjab in northeast in sri lanka in the gulf mm -hmm. the anandmen as, as we speak now it's almost the 25th anniversary of the anandmen massacre the war in afghanistan and and some political stories here but i had not covered uh, political uh, the political story in india as a classical political journalist so this column uh, and the indian express which is a premier political paper they both gave me the opportunity to uh, to look at that in a certain way and i think i learned about indian politics as i went along with the column in fact uh, the 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 uh, the inception of the of the column itself the, the name itself uh, has an interesting story of its own Yes, absolutely. I had equally, uh, I, as usual, you know, uh, when I want an idea, I walk around the newsroom because newsroom are so full of uh, talented people, particularly mm -hmm. at the Express. And I said, "Boy, I have to start writing a column. Somebody give it a name." Uh, and I said, "My condition is give it name under which I can write about anything. So don't say national security, uh, because those days my one of my main interests used to be national security and defence. Mm -hmm. Or don't say politics. Don't say statecraft or." anything mm -hmm. it, it, columns at that time something was called state crafts i think harish khare's uh, jairam ramesh used to write kotilya uh, which was again politics diplomacy whatever mm -hmm. more more politics so i said give me something under which I, ca i can write about anything i feel like including cricket or hockey or wrestling or uh, or uh, or a personality mm -hmm. under which you could i could even write very uh, wrong matter for an obituary right uh, or 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 where i could write about society politics anything so one of my colleagues uh, s prasanna rajan who's now the editor of open magazine mm -hmm. he come he came up with the idea national interest and he said look uh, since you talked about cricket nothing affects national interest more than cricket and once you say national interest you can say just about anything so many things have been written under this head many obituaries have written have been written uh, uh, arjun singh uh, I think the headline was a constant congressman, mm -hmm. General Sundar Ji, Indra Gujral. Uh, uh, many of the people I have known uh, yeah. over time have featured there. You've always been very fearless uh, in whatever you wrote, and that would have also attracted a lot of brickbats from the people you wrote about. Well, uh, I think more than fearless. I think I, I think reckless because fearless <laughs> is at least rational. You think yeah. about, you weigh your risks, and is it okay? 
ये करना है नहीं करना है ठीक है मैं डरता नहीं बट आई थिंक इट सर्टन रेकलेसनेस वेन यू स्टार्ट टू राइट एंड वेन आइडिया डिवेलप्स ब्रूज इन योर हेड इट डिवेलप्स इट इवॉल्व देन then it evolves the way it evolves then you check it out in terms of fact sometimes i even uh, i almost n- nothing i write gets published without one of my, some of my colleagues seeing it closely and many of them come up with disagreements or objections or corrections and 9 out of 10 they win mm-hmm. uh, so and and as time has passed they in fact their winning percentage has increased because i have also figured as time has passed mm. also your, your own confidence uh, initially you are also more insecure that i have written this ye kaise keh raha hai isko kya pata hai but you know as, as time passes you also think that people know more than you and ultimately if something something improves in what you're writing it will be seen as your writing not as someone else's writing so i i've been very blessed to have great colleagues uh, and also uh, besides the fact that they've had great they have great intellect they've never never been afraid to question me now the other interesting thing about uh, the way you write is it looks like you know it's something that was written in one sitting in terms of the language that you use it's uh, it's very accessible and uh, uh, very us the people who read newspapers do you feel that uh, that's conscious or does it well, just well first thing is, is is a statement of fact i do write in one sitting mm-hmm. uh, one sitting means uh, i i do tend to take breaks in the process of writing the stroll out do just do gap shop and gossip with mm-hmm. somebody mm-hmm. but not uh, i think the overall writing including the breaks never take takes more than 90 minutes okay. so in fact i can write a whole column happily on a daily bombay flight and i think many of them have been written like that some even in long hand as far as accessibility of the language is concerned look i i went to hindi medium schools so i don't think i have such a huge english vocabulary to begin with and i didn't read any english literature but besides that i think as time passes you also realize that the more accessible you make it the better it is because it's not just that more people will f- be not dissuaded from reading it further but also we are able to make the point much more clearly if we stick to normal language ordinary language mm-hmm. so for example i learned early enough and i think i read it somewhere i think i read it in some foreign writers uh, some article on the art of writing and he said don't use foreign words now in india we love to use foreign word de jure de facto <laughs> yes. right uh, right uh, how do you pronounce it fate comply fate uh, comply uh, 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 <laughs> or kya bolte hain nemesis <laughs> right uh, bet noir hmm. right i mean why do you have to say bet noir say an enemy or say whatever rival hmm. so uh, so i have also over time actually learned to use fewer bigger words and fewer sort of uh, foreign uh, expressions because foreign expressions we think are like uh, sui generis right mm. uh, we think are they are there is shortcut but a lot of people just think they are legalese right and right. and frankly in our and also con- they are fashionable in, in our country we don't always use them correctly, correctly yeah. you see uh, I, mean, i learned this we always say oh uh, so and so has government has now put another 10% tax 10% such a this daylight robbery hmm. right everybody says daylight robbery i think i i'm sure in many of my columns i would have used the term daylight robbery to mean that mm-hmm. but just a couple of years back uh, we were in uh, in william wordsworth's native village in england hmm. and a guide was taking everybody around and and somebody one of the tourists noticed that the size of the windows were really tiny like this he said why are the windows so small hmm. it's like a bunker he said no that's because when napoleonic wars were going on uh the government needed to raise taxes to fund those wars so they put and they put many innovative taxes and one of those innovative taxes was on the size of windows and ventilators in your home oh. so the bigger the window the more tax you paid so everybody made their window shorter 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 as a consequence homes had no daylight so that was called daylight robbery mm-hmm. now it is an awful thing daylight mm-hmm. robbery but it doesn't mean the same thing as we think it means we think daylight robbery means a robber came into your house in broad daylight with everybody watching and picked stuff and went away in this case it's just a, this is straight denial of daylight so so in india we use a lot of uh, mixed metaphor and, and a lot of malapropisms and we can't go back uh to the bbc to l- learn to get it all right be as simple as possible yeah but the beauty of that is that we've kind of indianized these metaphors right. in the turn of phrase to suit our uh, convenience and it has acquired a life of its own so so that's fair enough isn't it well uh 
Yes, to some extent. Yeah. But uh, but on the other hand, the simpler you get, hmm. the less the danger of falling into this trap. Now, in these um, 900 odd columns, 19 years, how have you grown? There are many lessons you have learned that you mentioned in the introduction as a journalist and uh, your approach towards either the politician or the personality. That has changed. I think first thing is, uh, the first lesson is uh, that it's not correct to take absolute positions uh, on anything. I mean, there's an, you can take an absolute position that on, say, uh, say India being a secular country, right? Right. Uh, but you cannot take an absolute position on how that secularism is to be defined. Mm -hmm. It cannot be defined in one para in a constitution or in two paras in a court judgment. Everything in politics, everything in public life, everything in public discourse is dynamic, flexible, and it is uh, open to many interpretations. And those interpretations can change quite legitimately mm -hmm. uh, and quite morally correctly from time to time. So uh, so the fact, you know, uh, I mean, great line from Maynard Keynes, mm. that's, that as facts change, I change my mind. Mm. What do you do, sir? Uh, that's a lesson uh, which has come back uh, over time. And uh, because sometimes you also don't, don't have all facts. Right. And very often people who are taking certain actions also don't have all facts. As, as facts then change and people's actions, people's attitudes, people's approaches then evolve. So, so I think, uh, so I think uh, that, is, that is the biggest lesson. Particularly our politics, it's so diverse and so complex and so dynamic that it is really fraught if you take absolute, if you say so and so is a thief, right? Or so and so is a decoit and nothing is right with him, right? Or her. That's the wrong position. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, to say, uh, oh, so and so may be a thief, but there's a lot right with him or her. So I will ignore the fact that he or she is also a thief. That is also wrong. So everything is, uh, so either you can get caught in this black and white, which is a sort, of, sort of social media, Twitter, POV syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm against caste politics. Mm -hmm. Everybody is against caste politics. But why do you need caste politics? Can India live without caste politics? So those are lessons that you learn. Somewhere you also mentioned in your book that uh, one of the lessons you learned was not to get too involved. Huh. Do you think that a journalist can actually not get involved? I think if you if you learn to enjoy from the sidelines, right? Right. Uh, look, any game, cricket, hockey, football, wrestling, hmm. any game is enjoyed best by the spectator. Right. Because the player is much too caught up in winning, losing, what I did right, what I did wrong, there is risk of injury, uh, what will the press say tomorrow. Uh, a spectator enjoys it. So, uh, so I think a journalist has to develop the love of the game like an indulgent spectator who can be partisan. A spectator wants his team to win, right? But, but a journalist has to learn to enjoy being a spectator. And a journalist has to always remember that she is really privileged, that she's got this ringside seat in this whatever game she chooses to cover. So the, so the joy of being a spectator is what journalists must have. I think it's a great problem today that a lot of journalists think or they're persuaded to think that they are players. Right. They are not spectators. And, and if, the line between well, the player and the journalist is really very yes, thin. And, and if, even if they become players, right. they have to then, re, they then very quickly come to the conclusion Mm -hmm. that they are very minor players because politics is not for people who suddenly jump in the arena you know it's, it's a bit like uh, you know it's a line that my friend Montek Singh Alowalia spoke and I think it's quoted in one of the columns in a different context uh, so I sh must give him credit mm -hmm. he said we Indians are sometimes are like people who don't score a century in a match but who jump onto the field to congratulate the man who scored a century so that cameras would catch us <laughs> so, so, so that is the uh, temptation that journalists must resist. The other thing that uh, one notices in uh, these columns and in your columns otherwise also that the the opinion to be constant over so many years is very difficult because politics is like uh, shifting sands. There's a different mirage every day. So how, d how do you uh, remain consistent in your opinion? Or does that also change? No, opinion can change, you know. Right. Uh, in fact, it, it can change because opinion will be based on facts today. Mm -hmm. Opinion will not be based on what you want. That is the key thing. You see, uh, see, I think a lot of the opinion writers start thinking, oh, 
I can set the agenda. So it doesn't matter what the facts are. I'll tell you what the facts should be, and I tell you what should be done. Right? That is what I describe as a thoughter. Mm. You know, thoughter is somebody who's thought everything through already. <laughs> right? Uske baad na puchne ki zarurat, na sochne ki zarurat. You don't have to reflect. Mm. Uh, You've thought everything through, and frankly, our sort of commentariat is full of thoughters. And at the same time, I think there's a great deal of sort of boredom uh, with the thoughter class. So the the, the 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 need to resist the temptation to become a thoughter just because you have free space available to you to write whatever you want with full editorial freedom is a very is a very important one. You did mention that people hopefully are going back to reading papers, but do you, do you think that's really happening? Well, uh, I can only talk in terms of the response I am getting, say, from my writing. Mm -hmm. The response that the Indian Express has been getting for its writings on internet, right? Uh, and internet generally is used by younger people. So look, I think it's it does great disservice to the young people of India. If mm -hmm. you say, "Oh, young people are all into fun, mm -hmm. or movies, or glamour," they only read the second section of a newspaper which has paid news, mm -hmm. right? Uh, paid plugs. Uh, they read that also. They are interested in that, but young people in India are very aspirational, and they are competing, and they are competing in a very brutal environment. You know, lakhs of Indian boys and girls compete for nine thousand seats in IITs. Right. Right. Lakhs of Indian boys and girls compete for maybe a thousand seats of all kinds in all in all India services. Lakhs of Indian boys and girls compete for medical entrance test uh, tests. Mm. Then tens of lakhs compete. To get SAT scores, right? They all want knowledge. They are all curious, and they are intelligent. In many ways, they are more intelligent than us. So to think that young people are all dumb, and they will not read any of this is, I think, so self-defeating no, no, and so self-serving. No, not dumb. Probably disinterested. But do you think with the younger population? No, they are, in they are not un uninterested. I mean, look at the way uh, India's voting percentages are going up. Yes. You know, it's a it's a remarkable thing that in a society as diverse and large as ours, mm. where for Four years now, you've had this vicious, negative, farcical, and fraudulent movement against the political class. Right. Mera neta chhor hai. Don't, don't elect your leaders. We will select them. Some Mike Sai say award will, winner will come. Some Nobel Prize winner will come, and they will run you with a new bureaucracy, and we'll create a super bureaucrat called Jan Lokpal. Hmm. Because politicians are all bad. Huh? Uh, give me the option to say none of the above. And that will show up these politicians. What happened? Nothing happened with none of no, none of the above. It's just wasting a square in that form. Although I I have arguments with the Supreme Court judgment that allowed it. I think it was mm. arbitrary and un unnecessary. Mm. But now that it's there, these elections have completely shown it up. The most backward states in India, uh, Tripura, Mizoram, poorest state, backward is a loaded word, poorest states, uh, West Bengal. Even Tamil Nadu, which is yes. with a large number of uh, below poverty line people, are voting 85 percent plus. Mm. More than 85 percent plus people are coming out to vote. In fact, in election after election in India, you find that voters' voting percentages are not going by 10 percent. It's a misnomer to say when they go up by 60 percent to 70 percent, they've actually gone up by nearly 15 to 17 percent. Right. Right. Uh, or what the what 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 the uh, bankers would call uh, a thousand basis points, hmm. right? So this kind of increase in voting percentages is unprecedented in the history of democracy. And why is this happening? It's happening because India's India's youth bulge hmm. is now embracing politics and democracy. They are going out to vote because old people are declining in India. If, and also if, if the, the difference. If the young were getting disillusioned and uninterested, they would not be going out to vote. And also the uh, the difference between the aspirations and understanding of politics of Bharat and India youth are somewhere it's becoming similar. It's converging because yeah. you know uh, I mean you go to uh, I mean we we went to a home in a village uh, in Fulpur mm -hmm. constituency of UP, one of the most backward parts of right. UP. Uh, Fulpur is a constituency that Jawaharlal Nehru. So, uh, uh, and, and family sort of uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Pandit made famous, mm -hmm. but it was a home uh, with a few cows, some land, uh, retired sc school teacher's home, uh, no electricity. Old man sat on a cot mm -hmm. with a stationary fan, uh, but it had three TV sets. 
because he has two married children mm -hmm. so he and his wife and each one of his married children's family they have a tv set of their own and they buy two newspapers in hindi but they buy two newspapers so india it, indians are now consuming a lot of media and it doesn't matter where they are because one of the great successes of indian sort of what you call fast moving consumer goods uh, distribution is indian media both physical as in print as well as tv mm -hmm. you can go to the poorest village in india uh and you will find one thing you will find if, if you walk a dirty lane with filth and everything piled up as it is in in a lot of our poor villages you will still be walking under a maze of cables that's quite amazing right uh you know in some of the writings i did recently from bombay we published a uh, we had a visual of a new slum in bombay poor trust land new encro newly encroached slum just just made of tin and those uh, those 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 blue uh, polythene sheets each one of those units had a satellite tv dish absolutely so so so, so this is really narrowing yeah. the gap now you know in fact uh, this probably is my last question to you maybe the last comment uh, when when you went to the punjab assembly for your first uh, foray into political writing you were told by your sub editor to Uh, and uh, what was the court case the private and, motions you know because yeah. because the senior people uh, see in the afternoons and assemblies in parliament when all the substantive work is done yeah. there's a private motion yeah. so some uh, some member might have a, a private motion saying uh, we have a, we should have a uni uniform personal code mm -hmm. or somebody may just say something funny ban this film or these are all private but private uh, thing private but, but you're some editor flights flight, uh, flights of fancy so yeah. senior people usually sort of insult juniors <laughs> uh, or it. used to in the past who who were seen as pretenders to covering this big political yeah. thing you, you do this private motions yeah so i think the first time i and a colleague of mine uh, mm. were sent there and came back to office and he said oh, we got these three stories wonderful private motions yeah so the chief subordinate on the desk said you keep your private motions to yourself <laughs> don't offload them on my desk so <laughs> so just like you have grown as a as a journalist and a political commentator so has india and we do hope that uh, this anticipation of a wonderful india continues and people do continue to read your columns and of course the book thank you so much for being uh, on the program thank, thank you very much you know uh, uh, thank you very much most of all for reading the book i mean that itself proves to you that even tv stars read books now <laughs> thank you for thank being you. here